One of the biggest fears, and rightly so, when we're vibe coding or relying on AI to generate basically 80% of the code base is security. So in this video, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna outline basic areas of security you need to be mindful of to make sure you're not running into issues like Leo did on his vibe coding app. But I don't want you to worry. At the end of the day, we're all growing businesses here and we're all gonna make mistakes. And unfortunately, sometimes you learn the hard way and have to pay for those mistakes. So when it comes to security, the, the first one you're gonna to wanna to look into is rate limiting on your APIs, right? Normally you've got a server folder and got these public APIs that respond with data about your database. You wanna be able to limit the amount of times people hit them because otherwise, if they're public, they're just gonna get hammered and then they're gonna break your server or you're gonna get charged a bunch of things. Okay, so rather than explaining it, let's actually do this live uh, on a an app I'm building, a chat app, an AI chat app. So I know that I want to employ um, rate limiting inside of, these are all the API routes, right? Where all the, the action happens. So given that, I'll go to my assistant here to use a new chat and we'll go back into routes. Um, I tend to use, I tend to make my prompts like user stories. If you don't know anything about agile or user stories, it basically, you describe it from the perspective of the user. So, um, apply rate limits, uh, limits to the backend API. Let's see what it does here. Cool, express rate limit. That sounds pretty good. Let's have a look at the code. Express rate limit is an NPM package. And this is it. And then it just, you, we just use this limiter. So let's just have a quick look at this NPM package. I think this can also be a problem with uh, vibe coding is that you're just installing it. Um, and then, so I'm looking at things. I mean, it looks like a pretty active uh, code base, over a million downloads, nearly 2 million downloads looked pretty good to me so i'm going to go ahead and apply that and bob's your uncle we've applied rate limiting and i'll pause here and just say that everything we go through right now might be worth putting in your global rules particularly if you're using cursor or windsurf to make sure any apis that you're creating make sure that they are rate limited so on the api keys your api keys for any services that you use are like a password the moment you have access to the moment that someone has access to that api key they have password access to your database and they can do anything and what people have been doing is actually putting their api keys in the front end and sending that off to every request or having them buried in the code somewhere once again we're inside of replit here and if we open up a new window however you want to do that we've got a secrets panel here and this is where you're going to want to put all of your environment variables again depending on your system that you're using i know lovable doesn't have environment variables i don't think but i won't show you my environment but we've got a basically a an example environment variables which just reminds me i can commit this to github and whoever pulls this code base down will know what environment variables they need to chase up just make sure that anytime you're seeing any sort of api key access that you're not putting it in the client code in the front end code with your database it was row level security what basically this means is is a very simple thing in superbase you literally just go to the table and you turn it on um, in firebase it's done with rules and things like that it basically says only people who are logged in can make changes to this database. So again, if we go into our table editor here, actually, uh, if we go to database and go to policies, you'll see this little thing up here, which is all you need to click to disable or enable RLS. And most of the time, if we go into these policies here, this basically says that the ID, the user ID needs to match the authorized auth UID in the rules and policies. Rules and policies are gonna be dependent on which um, backend or database that you're using, but policies are available in Firebase as well, and it's basically a way of limiting 
who can put in rows to that database. And in our case here, it's people that the where the user ID matches the authorization ID. And when the conversation ID, there is a corresponding uh, conversation ID inside of messages. So hope that makes sense. Sometimes you want public people to be able to look at your database. Let's say, for example, you're on a listing website and someone goes to the page and sees a list of restaurants or something like this that get request or that request to the, your database that has all those listings, you want that to be public, but you don't want to have them, you don't want it to be public to be able to make amendments or add or delete any of that sort of stuff. But row level security is something that you can do very, very simply, very, very easily, and it will protect your database very, very well. Given that, let's talk about forms, let's talk about inputting database into database, always have some sort of spam protection or some recapture or something that's gonna prevent people hammering your database. People write bots to be able to break this sort of stuff and to constantly send off form. You, If you have a WordPress website, you will see so many attempted logins, people just spamming that input field. Similarly is verifying data on the back end. okay? You can have basic HTML5 form validation, heck, you can even have JavaScript form validation libraries to help people write out or, or submit the correct information, but it's just to help people. It's not a security preventative measure in the slightest. Basically, I'm che always checking whether they're an actual user um, and double checking these things at every single point to make sure the information I'm being sent is the correct information. This expects a provider, and if the provider doesn't equal one of these, I reject it. This sort of back at the checks that you need to check, checking that the parameters that are being sent through or submitted are as you expect them. Another thing I noticed with Vibe Coding is that, for example, on one of my apps that I've built, I had a toast, uh, I think it was Sonnet or something like this, uh, a toast mechanism. So if you made a change, it would pop up with a little toast thing to say changes saved or something like that. Halfway through the project, my AI just decides to in, uh, install its own, a separate Pop, uh, toast pop-up system. So I had two toast mechanisms uh, appearing through the site. So we really need to be mindful of the libraries that it's in, uh, that it's installing and cleaning up our dependencies after they've been installed. If you're no longer using, let's say you move from Firebase to Superbase, there's no point in having Firebase anywhere in that, in that uh, project. So there's a theme kind of occurring here is just verifying what's being created and always cleaning up things that it's leaving behind because it can very, very easily happen. Maybe it's a GDPR thing, maybe it's like a moral standpoint thing, but I always make sure I hash personal information, I'm building a chat app, like I say, but I don't want to read your messages. Only you should be able to read the messages that you send the chat application. Similarly, with journaling for clarity, you're submitting your personal thoughts and feelings to this app. So I wanna make sure those are hashed. And more specifically, I make sure that each user always has their own hash key, which is basically the key that determines how your messages are jumbled up. So if someone gains access to your information, they can't use their hash key to read your messages. So this is Journaling for Clarity, my journaling app, and you'll see this is someone's entries here, and it's just all garbage. And I can't decrypt this because it they've got their own personal um, hash key that can decipher this information. Similarly, these are chat, these are the for my Jupyter chat application. This is the title of a chat. Once again, um, completely jumbled up as a mess. Content here. I can't read it. It's all encrypted. So if we jump into the code, this is the journaling app. Basically, whenever someone logs an entry, I encrypt the data this side using that encryption key and before then sending it off to the database. And then when it, well, I receive it from the database, we decrypt the data here. See, we've got decryption and it's all happening on, I never send plain text up to the database whatsoever. Final one is make sure you look at logs because a lot of these, um, your server, whether it's Vercel, whether it's uh, Superbase, 
Just being mindful of user behavior. I mean, I like to install a hot jar on a lot of my websites to, to monitor user behavior, but also you get logs about what's being submitted, the data that's being submitted, all this sort of stuff. Just being mindful of how people are using the application is just such a surefire way to spot any sort of suspicious activity or something like that, that you can rectify then later on. That's kind of like a catch-all way of, I can only tell you so much, but there will be things, other areas that we can't spot. And the way to do that is through just monitoring the logs, logging in once a day, logging in once a week, looking what's going on and just seeing if there's anything weird happening that's popping up. So I hope this helped. Like I say, you've got rate limiting, you've got storing your environment variables on the website, verifying the data on the back end and not trusting the information that's being submitted through the front end. You've got row level security, recaptures, cleaning up your project as you go. Finally, just monitoring the application and just understanding what's happening, what your users are doing with it and making sure you're able to spot errors early. So there we go, like, subscribe if you haven't already, check my Patreon for early access to some of these videos and some bonus content. I really wanna thank everyone here that you can see who already supporting me on my Patreon and that is patreon.com slash 0x5m5. And until next time, happy no coding.